Good evening, everyone. Education USA Ghana team welcomes you to the seventh edition of our Facebook Live event. My name is Margaret Nyako. I am an Education USA advisor as the Education USA Advising Center in Kumase. Before we start with the session, I'd like to share with you something quick about Education USA. Did you know that Education USA has 550 advisors around the globe? The advisors are there to give you accurate, comprehensive, and current information about US higher education. This evening, we are joined by the Executive Director of International Admissions. She is Jennifer Blask. She will be talking about how to make your school application stand out. I believe you will enjoy this session. She's not here alone. We also have on board Andrew Thankson. He's also a student of the University of Rochester. He will be sharing his experiences with us. I also have with me my colleague advisor from Accra, Benis Afote. I encourage all of you to type your questions in the comments section you see there. Thank you so much. Relax and enjoy the session. Jennifer, the floor is yours now. Thank you so much and for that great introduction. Um, thank you so much to all of you for joining us. I'm gonna get started with a brief introduction of myself before we roll into the presentation. So as you've heard, my name is Jennifer Blask. I'm the Executive Director of International Admissions at the University of Rochester. I'm going to tell you more about Rochester later, um, but I, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am and a little bit about my background. So I've been working in college admissions for over 15 years now. The last 13 have been at the University of Rochester, specializing in working with international students. Um, it has been my pleasure over the last 13 years to get to know many international students and help them transition into and then out of the University of Rochester to go on to going back to improve their own communities and take their next steps in life. I'm really excited to turn things over right now to one of our current students, Andrew, who is going to introduce himself and tell you a little bit about his background um, and then we'll get started. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Thankson. Um, I'm from Ghana. I I'm from the Eastern region of Ghana over in Ibri. Um, So I'm currently a student at the University of Rochester studying computer science. Um, I originally started in electrical and computer engineering and um, I, I changed my major to computer science. And this is like one of the like many things that University of Rochester actually offers um, to students. I'm so excited to be here to answer all the questions that you may have. And also, I went through Education USA um, program. They have um, this program called um, the Competitive College Club, and they really helped me with all my applications, um, reading through my essays, and uh, just in general with advice, as uh, Margaret mentioned earlier. So I'm happy to be here and would be glad to um, answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Andrew. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now with all of you, and we're going to get into our presentation. So first, to share what we're going to spend time on today, we're going to start by spending about 15 to 20 minutes talking about how you can make your application stand out. Um, as you know, it is a very competitive process to apply for admission in the United States, and so we're going to help you to make your application even better. We'll then spend some time giving you an overview of the University of Rochester, and then we'll open things up for questions. Please continue to set, send those questions throughout the presentation that you think of so that we have a good number of questions ready for when we get to that part of the presentation. So I'm gonna start by giving you an overview of admissions. So in the United States, um, at a selective or highly selective school, there typically is an admissions committee that's made up of admissions staff like myself. And it also might be made up of faculty, professors, teachers, deans. Those are like senior fancy staff people, right? Um, 
who are looking to, you see this word, sculpt the class. We're trying to create a class. Um, so we're trying to kind of pick students from all over the world, all over the United States, who have different academic interests, um, who are going to bring different things to campus. And as you can see, one thing they look for is fit. Students who are going to be most likely to stay with us through graduation and go on to become successful alumni of the institution. Most selective colleges are looking for some obvious things, of course, right, intelligence, good grades, motivation, passion, but also some other things that you might not think of right away. Things like your character, the type of person you are, that's really important to us. Your ability to contribute outside of the classroom. In the United States, we want students who are going to be involved in extracurricular activities, in clubs, in athletics, in service, things like that. Um, and we really are looking for a diverse student body. So we are looking for students from all over the world. We are looking for students who um, span the socioeconomic spectrum, students who are from, you know, families where students have gone to college for many, many generations, all the way through students where this will be the first student in their family to go to college. Um, things we might consider are things like ties to the university, um, if you have a parent or a grandparent who went to that school. But typically, there are no minimums or quotas. So we don't have, you know, we're looking to have X number of students from Ghana or from Africa, for example, or from a particular state. Um, we really are looking for this diverse student body. And some things we consider are certainly your academic credentials. You know, what classes have you taken? How have you done on exams and things like that? recommendations, essays, scores. The whole point here, what I want you to see is that we're looking at a lot of things. Um, there are a lot of different ways to measure your potential success at each school. And so each student is really going to be value, uh, evaluated individually. And this is a whole big long list of some of the many factors we consider in admissions. And I think some are really easy to think about, right? Test scores. Everybody knows that's something colleges look, like, look at. Well, this year, did you know that no Ivy League school in the United States will require test scores? And that the vast majority of colleges and universities in the United States this year will not require SAT or ACT scores. It's a huge barrier that's been brought down for students. Um, you know, you know, obviously we're looking at your grades, but look at all of these other things that we're looking at. Andrew, can I ask you to maybe share a little bit about what was your experience like? Did How did maybe you um, have some of these different things valued as you went through the college process? Definitely. Um, so as you mentioned, most people usually think that um, test scores um, are the only thing, and so did I get a, if I didn't get a perfect score, I'm not gonna get into my dream school. Um, but for me, it just happened that I actually took the SAT twice, and the first time I didn't do as well as I wanted to, but that is the, um, the test score I used to apply to the University of Rochester as an early decision student and got into. So my second one became pretty much irrelevant, and what I found that really helped me was staying true to who I am as a person. So I kind of, I looked into um, my life and asked myself, okay, because Education USA was always telling us um, they want to see who you are as a person. They don't just want to see, oh, you're smart, that's it. They want to know um, uh, what are you involved in? Um, what are your passions? What are your values? And so I... When I, wanted, I looked into ways in which I can actually show that to the school. And so in my essays, I talked about how I started a nonprofit that um, helped um, students in Ghana to um, help reduce uh, the current dropout rate. And then I talked about how I was involved in school, my leadership positions, and um, pretty much I also had recommendations from friends who knew me, I guess, better than myself. And so it all happens that uh, it's very important to, first of all, consider your, um, yourself as a person and then see if the school's a fit for you. And then once you see that, oh, 
I really want to go um, to the school, then you start looking into how can I um, show them who I am so that if I am a fit for them, then everything works out pretty fine. So I would say it's not all about test scores, your essays matter, your recommendations, values, in general, just who you are as a person is what you would want to present. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so now that we've kind of see, seen and heard some of these different factors, I wanna get into a little bit of how you can help to make those different things stand out. Like how Andrew was able to talk about that experience that he had with the nonprofit, how to make that a, a focus of his application, right? So we're gonna go through, um, I have about five different areas you can work on and things to focus on to make your application stand out. Um, the first is to prepare yourself academically as much as possible. I think this is the easy one, right? You all know that you should do really well in classes and that colleges want to admit students who have done well with classes. Um, I don't even think we need to spend much more time there. I think that one is so obvious. Everyone knows that one. You know, you really want to do well um, in order to make yourself as competitive as possible. So I'm going to move right on for that one. And if you have questions about it, you could go ahead and, and, and put those in and we can answer them later, but I think that one's pretty easy. Um, next is to answer every question on the application concisely and completely. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of what not to do um, and what to do here. So on the application, so most students when they apply to the University of Rochester and most schools in the United States will use the common application. Andrew, did you use the common application when you apply to colleges? Yes, I did. Yeah, did pretty much everyone you know use the common application? Yep, everyone. Yeah, the common application, right? So yep. on the common application, Andrew, I'm gonna ask if you remember this. Do you remember on the common application that there's an area where they ask you to like list all of your extracurricular activities? Yes, I yes. do. Yes, and did you list your extracurricular activities there? I did. Good, yep. because you know what you should not do, what drives us absolutely crazy in admissions offices is when students write C resume. I don't want to see your resume. If I want to see your resume, I wouldn't have this section on the common application, right? So many schools will allow you to send a resume and you can feel free to do that if you want to but you should also fill in that section. Because what I think, if you don't, is maybe you're lazy. Maybe you don't think that that's worth your time. So maybe you've got a little bit of an ego issue, right? Maybe you can't take down, maybe you have, you know, on the Common App, it limits you. There's only so many activities you can put in. Maybe it's something, I don't even don't remember the exact number, but it's like seven. Maybe you have 10 activities. Well, I want to see as an admissions counselor, how you go from 10 to seven. What's the most important to you, right? That's a skill to be able to take something that's bigger and make it smaller. Maybe you couldn't do that, right? So what happens when you leave things blank or you don't follow the, the directions is we start to assume things about you that may or may not be true. You don't want us to do that. You want to give us all the information we've asked for. So we're thinking what you've told us rather than what we're just kind of guessing, right? Um, you want to make sure that you check those details, right? Um, you want to make sure that you can um, really, um, Andrew, do you want to pop in and say something? I can't, I can't seem to see the chat, but I don't know if you want to pop in. Oh yeah, so I wanted to say, um, that also for, for the first one, um, you don't worry to, I guess like you have to do well, but don't worry if let's say your test didn't go well or because it shows throughout your transcript. And then for the um, other ones too, I wanted to say that if like going from 10 to seven, as you said, um, there are lots of ways through the supplement, through your essay that you can show different aspects of you. So you want to take advantage of all these different platforms to show them who you are and the various, um, I guess, aspects of you as a person. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. You also want to make sure that you're being detail oriented in your application, right? So you want to try to limit your mistakes 
Some ways you can do that are by not working on your applications at the very last minute. Um, you know, if you are looking to apply for next year, you can start working on some aspects of your application. Now, the applications for most schools will go live in August, um, and they won't be due until November, December, January, depending on the school. So you've got plenty of time to work on those things. It's when we're rushing at the last minute that we tend to make more mistakes and you have less time for review. So take that time. Um, a lot of schools will have supplemental questions where they'll ask specific things about their school. So like, for example, at Rochester, we do this, we have a specific question and all the time students will kind of miss an opportunity there because they'll do things like not answer the question. Um, last year, our question was about how you improve, how you've improved your community. And so many students just wrote an essay about why they wanna to come to Rochester. They just answered a different question that wasn't answer, asked of them. And it made us really frustrated in the admissions process. And maybe that's not a student who's then going to stand out in that process or not stand out in a good way, right? Um, always get the school's name right. Students all the time call us Rochester University. We never call ourselves Rochester University. We're University of Rochester. Um, and so that's a way that you can just kind of show a school that you know them well or you don't by using the correct name or by not using the correct name. Um, you want to talk about how you're making a difference now. So something we're really interested in as schools is the impacts that you've made on those around you, um, the impacts that you've made in your community. Everyone's community is different. So we're not expecting you to have done the same things as someone else. We're not expecting that you've had the same resources as someone else. So it's thinking about what were your set of opportunities and what did you do with them, right? And so this is going to be different for everyone. Andrew talked about this nonprofit. That's really cool and interesting. And if you don't have that to share, don't feel like you need to run out right now and create a nonprofit, right? Um, but what is your thing? What is What thing are you interested in? Um, what are you really passionate about? That's what you want to tell us about. Do not tell us about 12 different things that you're passionate about because you are not passionate about 12 different things. No one is, right? Tell us about those few things that are really interesting about you, um, that really gets you kind of fired up, that if I were to ask you a question about, your eyes would get a little bit wider and you get a little bit more excited. Focus on those things instead of telling me about 87 different things that you did one time, right? Um, you wanna think about what is your hook, right? So if you're trying to make your application stand out from thousands of applications, what's interesting and different about you? Anything to add, Andrew? Yeah, definitely. I, I think you you said it pretty well. Um, okay. So in, in general, just think about who, I, who am I as a person and how can I show that to the university? Awesome. So you want to think about your personal statement. In the application process, a lot of the application is kind of done before you even start filling it out, right? So some of the things we ask you to submit are things like your transcripts, your mark sheets, right? Your educational history. You can't go back in time and change that. It is what it is, right? Your letters of recommendation, those aren't written, but they're written by your teachers, right? Because you've already had years of showing them how awesome you are, or not awesome, how, you know, what type of person you are, what your character is. You can't change that now, right? There's so many things that are like that. The personal statement is an area where you have so much control. And in a minute, I'm going to share some tips on writing a great essay. Um, but you really want to think about what you're saying about yourself. This is an opportunity to stand out from other applicants and really focus on what's different about you. Um, the best essays are direct and honest, they're not kind of weaving all over the place or um, it's not going to be you know, a piece of creative writing. It's probably not going to be your best piece of writing ever in your life. It shouldn't be, right? Your writing's gonna get better and better. And by the time you graduate from college, you should look back on that essay that you wrote and go, oh my gosh, 
but it should reflect who you are right now, right? Um, and I'm gonna share some tips on how to write a great essay in just a minute. Um, and then lastly, um, demonstrated interest, or sometimes it's called demonstrated understanding. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a minute as well, but we have so many applications. Rochester last year received about 20,000 applications. We look to admit about 30% of those applications. Um, and you know, we're looking to get a class of about 1,400 students. 90% of our applicants are admissible, 90%. That means if, I, if I'm doing the math correctly, right, that's you know, 1,800 students or so that we could admit, or 18,000, I'm sorry, 18,000. We can't, we can't admit that many. We wouldn't have any place to put them. We couldn't house them. We wouldn't be able to put them in our classes. So we have to go from 90% all the way down to 30%. And one of the ways we do that is by looking at your essays and things like that. But we also look at who really wants to be here? Who has done their research on Rochester? Who has engaged with us? Who has learned about our, our school? Who has participated in sessions like this? to learn more, that's called demonstrated interest. You're demonstrating your interest to a school. Um, and so that's something that many selective colleges, not all, will look at to understand how many students, they, you know, which students to submit. I'm gonna get a little bit more into that in just a minute. So quickly, I'm gonna share some tips on how to write a great essay. Um, I will mention later in the presentation, Rochester actually has an hour long presentation on just writing a great essay, and it's for all schools applying to the, in the US, not Rochester specific. Um, so that could be a great way to, to learn more. But um, one of these we already talked about, number one, start early. I already talked about that, so I'm going to leave it there. Don't wait till the last minute. Um, brainstorm, make an outline. A lot of students will actually brainstorm a bunch of different topics. They may even write a rough draft of a few different essays. Um, and then you could give them to like friends or family members and say, which one do you think is most interesting? Which one made you want to read more? And then that's the one you kind of focus on and work more and more on. Um, follow instructions. I told you before, it drives us crazy when you don't. Um, choose a topic that is important or personal to you, okay? So if you think about if you are in a, a class, right, and you've been with that class all year long, if you were to write your essay for college in the U.S., and you were to hand them into your teacher and you didn't put any names on them, a really good essay is one that your teacher could hand back to each student individually because they can tell that only you could have written that essay. No one else could have. So you really want it to be personal to you. You wanna keep your focus narrow, right? Don't tell us about the last 18 years of your life in you know a couple hundred words. It's impossible, it doesn't work, it doesn't, it, it's boring, sorry, um, but it just is. So focus on something specific, something small. Um, um, you wanna start with an attention grabbing hook. Give me a great first sentence or two that makes me wanna keep reading. On an average day, when I'm reading applications for admission, my goal is to read 30 in a day. If you're number 29, you want to make sure you grab my attention so I keep reading that essay because I've already read a lot that day, right? So grab our attention. Um, make it interesting. Make it vivid. Make me kind of be able to see the place. Um, reflect on your feelings and how you were impacted. Sometimes students will write this great essay about this experience and then it ends. And I go, what happened? What happened after that, right? So make sure you're showing that you can reflect in what you've learned from that experience. Be honest, be authentic, be you. I think we already talked about that. Um, maintain your voice. It should not be written like a 45 year old woman wrote it, right? It shouldn't be written like your mom wrote it or your advisor at Education USA wrote it. We can tell the difference when like, you know, uh, you're all adults, but like an adult adult, you know, like someone in their 40s wrote an essay versus like the voice of like a teenager or 20 year old. Like it's just different. Um, so make sure it sounds like something you would write. Um, proofread, proofread, proofread. Spell check does not catch everything. Um, there are lots of words that are still words that you don't want to be using in your uh, essay. I won't give you specific examples, but I think you know where I'm going with that. 
Um, get feedback from others, mention that, and then have fun. I think that's really easy for me to say because I don't have to write this essay, um, but try to make it as, um, as fun as possible. Do you want to add anything, Andrew, on the, on the essay? Yeah, I think that's great. Um, also, just show, I guess, a bit of like, you know, you know about the school, as you mentioned earlier, you don't want to be using um, references that um, I guess the school doesn't relate to. Yeah. So it's like saying uh, Rochester University instead of University of Rochester, if you happen to be um, working on a prompt that um, is maybe why you want to go to the university. So uh, also, if you're having, I guess, an issue with starting, the, the prompts are really great. And so if you're able to, if it's your um, common up essay, if you look at the prompts, they really, I guess, help you to know where to, I guess, get started and then pick whichever you think um, would show for who you are as a person and just go for it. I think that's um, all I would want to add. Awesome. I'm going to just briefly share about another area, and that's an admissions interview. You want to check and see if schools that you're applying to offer these. Um, if they do, and they're even if they're optional, do it. Um, they, you know, schools are now, especially given what's going on with COVID, more and more and more things are being offered online. We do all of our interviews online, um, and so they're a really great way for us to see you as a person, to get to know you beyond just, you know, your application. Um, it's also an area just like the essay where you have control of the process. Um, and so you really want to use that. Um, also, it depends on how long it is, but at Rochester, our interviews are about 20 minutes and we only spend about 20 minutes reading applications, each application. So if you do an interview, you double the amount of time that we're spending on your application just by doing that interview. And so it really is really beneficial to students. Um, you want to really show us who you are. It's a great time to, I think, I think a lot of students want to be humble, which is a really great personal character trait, but this is a great time to brag just a little bit. You don't want to be a show off. Nobody likes, you know, someone who's really bragging, but it is not a time to kind of hold things back. It's a time to really share about yourself and about your accomplishments. Um, you don't want to be pre to pretend to be somebody else or somebody you think I'm looking for um, because it doesn't work. We've done this long enough that we can tell when someone's just telling us something they think we want to hear. Um, and it, it doesn't work very well. Um, prepare some questions ahead of time um, so that it shows, you know, that you're really invested and you're interested. Um, let your personality shine through. I think you can see that I'm a really chatty person. Um, I'm a pretty happy person. And so I want that to shine through in my interview so the person can get to know me. If you're kind of just trying to just be so buttoned up and professional, you don't, you can't really make it a, a relationship with someone. And that's what you're trying to do. Um, Andrew, did you do an interview when you applied for admission? Yes, I did. And I, will, I actually did two interviews, one for admissions and one for my scholarship. And I would highly recommend that you do an interview if you have the opportunity, just because um, it really helped me to talk more about my application, just um, bring to life who I am as a person, put a face behind my application, and just, you know, help them understand my motivations, why I want to be a Rochester, um, some things I wrote in my essay, um, I was asked about and also it's just um, the person who actually interviewed me we've been friends since I got to the University of Rochester till now she just graduated a um, um, couple months ago so yeah I'll definitely say um, if you have the opportunity definitely do an interview. Awesome um, so I know we're running late so I'm going to, that's kind of all we've got planned for making your application stand out. So send in those questions that you might have about making your application stand out. Andrew and I are now going to run through a really brief overview of the University of Rochester. And I'm going to make it brief because we have so many more opportunities for you to learn more about the University of Rochester, which I'll show you at the end of these bunch of slides. But this is a picture of our campus. This is Rush Rees Library. It's our main library. Um, it's beautiful. Um, we're very, very lucky. Beautiful. 
Yeah, yeah it is very beautiful. Um, I think a good thing to share is I bet a lot of you have absolutely no idea where Rochester is. Andrew, did you have any idea where Rochester was before you really started? Looking? I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. that, you know what? There's a whole lot of Americans that would say the same thing. So um, I don't blame you. Rochester is the third largest city in New York State. We're on the East Coast in the U.S., you can see some other major cities and kind of how far we are from them um, by car. Um, Andrew, have you been to some of these cities? Yes, um, I've been to Boston with friends. Okay. You haven't yeah. been to New York yet? Oh, New York, yeah, I flew into New York. So I've been... Everybody goes to New York. So it's yeah. far, but it's also not that far in some ways too. Yeah. Uh, this is a picture of our campus. It really is beautiful. I often say that it makes my job in admissions so much easier to share this campus with students because it's so beautiful. Um, we, You can see the back downtown kind of the skyline. You guys can tell it's not the size of like London or, you know, Shanghai or New York City. We are a smaller city. We have about a million people in the city and surrounding area. Um, about a quarter of a million people live in the city itself. Um, our campus that you can see the river campus there in the foreground of the picture, we have about 5,500 undergraduate students pursuing bachelor's degrees and about 5,500 graduate students pursuing advanced degrees. Um, we do have several other campuses of the university. So if you are interested in um, medically related research and things like that, we have a medical center right across the street from our campus. We also have the second largest laser lab facility in the United States is a part of our university, just a few blocks from our river campus. And then we have the Eastman School of Music, which is one of the best schools of music in the world located downtown. And our campus is located right between a river, which you can see in the, in the picture, and a giant cemetery on the other side. So I often joke with students that we have very quiet neighbors at the university. <laughs> Did you guys get that? It's a really bad joke. Um, all right, so what we're known for, right, um, is our curriculum. If you guys have done research on the U.S., you'll know that most schools in the U.S. require that you spend about a year to a year and a half of your four years taking what are called general education courses, some schools call them core courses or um, distribution requirements or liberal arts requirement. They're different everywhere, yet exactly the same somehow everywhere, um, where you usually take something like two math classes, two foreign language, a history class. Um, hopefully you know what I'm talking about. And we used to have that at Rochester. But what we found was that students were spending a lot of time on classes that they really didn't care about, classes that they just had to get through to graduate. And so what we did at Rochester was we threw it out the window, we got rid of it, and we replaced it with a curriculum that is built upon research that shows that when you are learning things that you're interested in, that's when you do your best learning, that's when you do your deepest level of inquiry. And so now as a result, we have no required subjects. So if you hate language, you never have to take a language class at, your, at Rochester. If you hate math, you never have to take a math class. Andrew, what's something that you were like, ugh, I never want to take that ever again? Um, let me see. I would say <laughs> physics, just because. Me too. Uh, yeah, I actually decided to go for electrical engineering to computer science. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's probably some physics related stuff in there. No. <laughs> no, nothing? You're able to avoid it? No physics class required. I'm just thinking. Perfect. So that's the whole idea is like, take the stuff that you are into, take the computer science, right? And just ignore the stuff that you're not into. Um, we do still have requirements. So we require that all first year students take a writing course. That's because writing is really important. And we want you to have a really solid foundation for both the rest of your classes in college, but also for life. Um, we then require classes within your major, right? So you will you can hear that some majors don't require physics, but if you were a physics major, you'd have to take physics, right? Um, or if you're an engineering major, for example, you have to take math, right? Um, that makes sense. We want our buildings to stay standing and not collapse, right? Math is important. But if I'm a French major, I don't have to take any math classes, right? So every major will have some requirements in them. Um, and then you also have to take at least two clusters, 
Now, this is a weird Rochester thing that nobody really gets anywhere else. But essentially what it is, is we want you to learn across the curriculum, just like at all those other schools in the US. We want you to learn from the humanities, the social sciences, and the natural sciences and engineering. But rather than telling you, you have to take one of this and two of that, and one of this, we're gonna give you the choices. So you're gonna pick a major, it's gonna fall into one of the three categories. So for example, Andrew chose computer science, even though he didn't come in thinking that's what he wanted, he figured that out when he was here and he switched his direction. Computer science is of course a natural science. So he's got that major there and then he'll need to take a cluster in the other two areas. So for his case in the humanities and the social sciences. Um, and a cluster is a set of three thematically related courses. So for example, like in the humanities, it could be three French classes, three dance classes, three art history classes, um, within social sciences, it could be things like three psych classes, three political science classes, three econ classes. And I'll actually have a couple of examples and then Andrew can tell you exactly what he's doing. So you can see this student is an economics major and they're doing a cluster in statistics and another in Spanish. Here's another student whose major is in the humanities, who's doing film and media studies, and they have a cluster in music cognition in natural sciences and they don't have a cluster in social sciences. And that's because they just added on to that cluster. So the cluster is kind of the minimum you have to do, but it's so common for so many of our students to just keep adding on and turning these clusters into another minor or even another major. Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about what you've done or what your plans are? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I am a computer science major, so that's in the natural sciences. Um, for class I decided to do philosophy for the humanities and actually I'm doing a philosophy minor as opposed to a cluster so exactly um, like this because I hadn't really taken any um, classes outside um, say STEM classes so I really love the opportunity I got to be able to explore so I am in social sciences I'm doing psychology and I've also taken one or two econ uh, economics classes um, so I would end up maybe either using psychology or economics for my social science cluster requirement. Thanks for sharing. Um, gonna just run through, here's another example. So you guys have seen lots of those examples now. Um, Rochester has about 45% of our students graduate with double majors because of that flexibility with the curriculum. 95% of our students participate in internships and about 77% of students participate in research. Andrew, have you done any research or have plans for research? Yes, um, I'm currently doing a research program with the optics department. And yeah, I, this summer I'm working remotely as an intern at a tech company. So I've done both, yeah. Awesome. Um, and then um, just because we're really short on time, a little bit about student life. Um, 90% of our students live on campus all four years. There are kind of different housing options every year. Um, we didn't mention the makeup of our student body, um, but we're 29% international students. You actually can see a whole bunch of them um, in that picture on the bottom there is a bunch of our international students. Um, many, if not all of them, I'm trying to look, my old eyes aren't as good as they used to be, are from Africa, really cool. Yeah, you know a bunch of those people, don't you? Yeah, I know a bunch of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so those are real students. I didn't make them up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, um, we have over 300 student organizations, so lots of different things to get involved with. Andrew, what are some things you're involved in outside of the classroom? Um, so I'm an office assistant um, in our Hagen School, which is our engineering school dean's office. Um, in my first year, I was an eco rep, so um, that program is basically helping to spread the word about sustainability. So I was on my floor just helping um, the floor be more sustainable. During my sophomore year, um, I was an international student mentor, which I still am, and also a first year fellow. Um, and that is staying with first years and helping them um, adjust to academics. Yeah, so I have um, been uh, around a lot, like we rest life, residential life. Um, I've done a lot with them too. So yeah, those are like some of the things I'm involved in. Awesome, thank you.
In the interest of time, I'm gonna run here and let you guys know, if you want to learn more about Rochester, we offer virtual information sessions every Monday and Friday. We have lots of specific sessions about Rochester. So for example, later today, we have one about the city of Rochester. Um, we have one about research opportunities at Rochester, a Q&A with current students. Um, but we also have these general sessions, which I think will be, even if you're like, I don't care about Rochester, that school sounds boring, that's okay. Um, if you wanna just learn about how to make your essay better when you're applying to the US, we have a whole hour long workshop on that. Um, if you wanna learn more tips about interviewing, we have an hour long workshop um, for that. So you can go to that website. There's lots of things that are not specific to Rochester, but just to help you in your process. We're all educators. So we wanna help you as much as possible in this process. Um, I know we got started a little bit late today, so I wanna just roll things over to questions um, and open things up for about 15 minutes of questions. Um, I thank you guys for joining us and I'm gonna um, turn it back over to our colleagues in Education USA. Ah, thank you very much, Buck. That was a great presentation, but I have a lot of questions for you. Okay, so my first question is, what GPA does your, does your, your university require to apply for a master's program? That's a tricky one, and I will fully admit I have no idea. And that's because for our master's programs, each program admits separately. So the GPA requirements they might have in optical engineering could be very different than the requirements they would have in epidemiology. So if you're interested in a master's or a PhD program, you would want to reach out to that specific department to learn more about their specific requirements. Okay, so the next question is, what exam is required to gain admission into graduate school in Rochester? So again, it's gonna depend for graduate school, it's really gonna depend on the, part, on the department. Some programs will not require any testing. Um, they'll just look at your undergraduate study. Others might require the GRE. Um, some will require, um, you know, if you're applying to medical school, they'll be looking at a different test. So it's going to really depend on uh, the GMAT for some programs. It's really going to depend on the individual um, program that you're looking at. And again, for masters, you really want to reach out to those departments individually. Okay. So for those of you who just joined, you are watching Education USA Ghana Facebook Live events. I continue with the questions. Um, I need scholarship to further my education. What is the procedure, Jennifer? Sure, so I can speak a little bit about Rochester, but I think in general in the US, um, you wanna be looking to see, um, do these schools offer scholarships or do they offer need-based financial aid or do they offer both? So there are many schools, if not mo the vast majority of schools in the United States will offer scholarships. But oftentimes those will only cover a portion of the program. So if you really require a full scholarship in order to get you to that university, you want to make sure that they either have scholarships that are that large or that they also offer need-based financial aid. At Rochester, we offer both. Um, and our need-based financial aid meets 100% of the student's needs. That does not mean that you're, if you're admitted, we cover 100% of your costs, right? It depends on your individual family situation. Some families can afford to pay the whole cost, right, for them, right? Some families can afford a portion. Maybe they can afford, I'm making up numbers, $10,000, right? And some families can't afford anything. And so if we admit you, we're going to give you a package that covers what you need individually. It might also include some things that you heard Andrew talk about being an office assistant. It might include some work on campus. It might include some small loans. Um, we don't, we're, we want students to feel invested in their education um, without it being, you know, we don't wanna give someone way too much loan. So at Rochester, you would fill out the CSS profile, which is what most schools in the US use that are offering need-based aid to international students. There are some different forms as well, um, but that's what we use to determine what your family's financial situation kind of is and to understand what that investment is. Okay, thank you. Andrew, do you wanna add in a little bit? Go ahead. 
Yeah, so I was saying if you're wondering about uh, maybe what um, need-based aid, scholarships, what are the differences, all those things. Um, Education USA is a really great resource and they helped me understand all those things. And so I would really recommend like talking to them. They have a lot of resources to help you understand um, schools. How okay, so Benis, this question goes to you. Why don't most of these universities accept our secondary school certificates but demand SAT and other exams? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Um, interestingly, it's a mix. I think Jennifer mentioned something like that during the application process and she even gave an example of how Ivy League schools these days don't, you know, there's been a whole discussion and movement. So some most schools are moving away from making it a strict requirement for students to have a test like an SAT or ACT. Most schools now recommend, and we as advisors encourage our students to write it if it's recommended. But of course, it's the student's decision to take it or not to take it. Um, so most every school, if you are coming from a public system or the a curriculum, secondary curriculum that you need to take WASI, you will need to show your WASI. And then depending on whether the school requires or recommends the test, you will be taking it or not taking it. So it's a good mix. There are schools that don't require the test. They would rather look at your transcript and your WASI or other curriculum you've come from. They will look at the transcript and then the national or final exam from that curriculum. Thank you. Thank you too. Jennifer, back to you. What does a student need to study a master's in computer forensics? So again, I wish I could answer that question, um, but I'm just not an expert on each of our master's programs. You'd really want to go on our website um, and look up each individual program and reach out to that program because they'll have all those specifics for you. Okay, so I have a student here who is very worried. He's asking, the embassy is not open. How would students get visas? Okay, I'll take that. It's okay, true, right. the embassy is closed. Uh, we've been closed for three months now. And we, we don't know, or I don't know when we are going back. But remember also that the borders of Ghana are closed. So it's not mm -hmm. just the embassy. I will encourage all of us to keep our ears to the ground, as they say. We'll be monitoring the news to see. Once it becomes possible for the embassy to open, our big boss, Madam Ambassador, will announce and we will go back, the consulate will open. But until that happens, we are all not sure what or when. I will encourage every student who has an admission to, by way of preparation, still go onto the embassy's, face, um, embassy's web, website and review the visa application information just to be familiar with it. If you need to book dates or anything, go ahead and do whatever you need to do. So that when it becomes possible for life to go back to our put normal in court, then you won't have to rush to get a date or to prepare to understand the visa process. So um, that's my piece of advice. I know it's worrying, but I think some schools are also giving students the option to start studying online. I don't know if Jennifer will talk to that, but there are a lot of options. So even if you can't go physically this fall, there's a way you can still start school or you can defer your admission. So Jennifer, over to you to add. Yeah, I, I would add too that you are not alone. Um, it is not that this is a problem in Ghana and everywhere else is sunshine and rainbows. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Um, and so because of that, we are making alternate plans. So for example, at the University of Rochester, students can take classes online this fall. Um, and then once they secure their visa, 
they can come and then switch to in-person classes. Um, so we're living in very different and unprecedented times where we all need to exhibit a lot of flexibility. Um, and I think that advice is so spot on of get yourself ready, um, look for other options, things like the online options at schools, um, and, you know, go when you can. Um, and, and, and that's all we can do at this point is wait and be prepared for when things do resume. So I have another question for you, Jennifer. Do you offer scholarships? How do we factor that in our application process? Yeah, so we, we do offer um, scholarships and Andrew can talk in a minute about the scholarship, um, kind of his experience and maybe experience of some of his friends um, who maybe came to Rochester or who didn't. Um, we do offer scholarships. We also offer need-based aid, which is scholarships are based on you. It doesn't matter if your parents are billionaires or if you don't have parents and you have no funding at all. They're based on you. How have you done in high school? What do you have to write in your essay? Um, what have you done outside of the classroom? It's just based on you. Whereas need-based aid is based on how much you need, not want, to come to the university. Um, and so you do wanna look at, is the school I'm applying to going to have enough aid that if I'm admitted, I can actually go? Um, and so it is really competitive. Um, if you don't need money, I'll be very honest with you, it's easier to get in because just like with your family budget, we have a budget. Um, and so I have a certain amount of money that I can allocate to students. And so if you need the full cost of attendance, which is a lot of money, I'm not gonna pretend it's not. At Rochester and at most private schools, highly selective schools in the United States, our cost of attendance is about $80,000 per year, okay? And so if you need $80,000 to come, you have to be really strong. You have to be really interesting because I can take one of you or I could take four students who need $20,000 or two students that need $40,000, right? I mean, so in order for you to get all that money, you've got to be really strong and interesting and interested um, in us. And so the more money you need, the certainly the more competitive it is. Um, Andrew, I know, is on the most competitive scholarship we offer at the University of Rochester. He killed it, you know, in his interviews and in his application. Um, so he's a good one to ask questions about that. Um, but Andrew, do you want to talk at all about your experience? Yes, definitely. Um, so uh, when I was applying, I, I did fill out the CSS profile, which is for financial aid. And I also got a nomination for the scholarship um, I ended up getting. And so after interviewing for the scholarship and then I got it, it, it covers my, I guess, like all the aid I need. And so that ended up working out well. But most of my friends actually are on need-based aid. And so it's pretty much the school is committing to me um, whatever amount you require to be able to attend. And so yeah, definitely. Um, if you there are specific scholarships that you qualify for, definitely try to apply for those and also um, fill out the CSS profile to be considered for need-based aid. Okay. So I would ask my last question um, before we end our session for today. So this question goes to Jennifer. What is the position of SAT for this year's application. Do you mean like how important is it? Or what, yes. what number do we need? How important it is. Yeah, so at Rochester and at the vast majority of colleges and universities, particularly this year due to COVID-19, um, Rochester is test optional meaning you could submit test scores if you want to. If you don't want to, that's okay too. That wasn't the case when Andrew applied. We had a different policy. This was the last year was the first year we had this policy. And now the majority of schools in the United States have this policy, either because 
they came to think like we did, or years before they came to think like we did, that it's not all about these tests. Lots of other things tell us about your ability to be successful. And so you don't have to submit these tests if you don't want to. Um, but this year in particular, it's extra hard to take those tests, right? It was already hard. There was already very limited testing dates and some of you would have to travel really far distance to take those tests and it, there weren't very many spaces. It was already hard. Well, now you add COVID on top of that, the coronavirus, and it's just so many test dates are canceled or people are, we don't want you to be so nervous while you're taking the test that you're gonna catch the, you know, virus from the student sitting next to you that you can't focus, right? So um, we really want you to, to not worry about that. And so that's why none of the Ivy League schools, Harvard, Yale, all those schools you know that everybody knows, they no longer require that testing, right? And all the other schools that maybe you don't know as well, the vast, vast majority of them do not require it. That said, if you take it and you're awesome, you should submit those scores. Um, right. Um, and that's something where, you know, I think Andrew said something great before. Use the staff in the Education USA offices. They know their stuff. They know what they're talking about. You don't need to hear it from us because we are in con communication with them. We rely on them for their expertise so much. Um, so use them and they can really help you guide you in that process to help you make sure you have an application that's going to stand out as much as possible. Thank you. Um, so Andrew, Benny, Jennifer, do you have any final words for my cherished viewers? Do you have any message for them before we end our session today? I think for me, Jennifer just um, said that you said education USA. Um, and also if you all could provide um, where they can find you online and how they can reach you just so they can um, get access to those resources because it really helped me personally so yeah okay yeah i think for me jennifer said everything i want to encourage everyone who is listening to not be worried we will get through this together it's not an individual's case it's for the whole world so we should all be patient as we work our way through. But it doesn't or shouldn't stop you from aiming at your highest dream. Still go for it and you achieve it. Okay. Thank you for joining us, Jennifer, Andrew, and Benny. This session has been very helpful. So you, my cherished viewers, I believe you've learned so much. Please be sharing your experiences on our pages. Next week, same time, we will be coming your way again with another interesting topic. I wish you all the best and have a good evening.